So the, the usual first question I ask is, who's speaking English, who's speaking German? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say I know some folks that only speak English, so I'm going to stick with English. Because usually, sometimes it is that only German speakers are here and everybody's speaking English, and in the end you're like, what? Okay, I'm, I'm most, some people might actually know me. I'm Felix I'm from Ascara. I'm, I'm one of the founders of this user group a few years ago. Um, there's one of our co-organizers back there. Live stream can't see it. <laughs> there is a live stream, Jills. Why don't you come here? <laughs> um, and uh, this is Anne. Um, Anne is going to do or take over the task of organizing all of this um, for the future. So um, I'm not going to say anything else. Um, I'm just going to hand that over. OK, hi. Um, we're not as many as I hoped, but I hope it's going to be very informative for everyone. Like Felix said, I'm Anne. I'm going to be organizing the search user group uh, from now on. And this is my first organized uh, search user group. So I'm very happy that InfoPark took the time to prepare one talk and to give us a space and good food. And <laughs> very happy. <laughs> and I'm going to hand over. We're going to hear um, a short introduction who InfoPark is so we know where we're actually having our user group today. Cool. Hi. Um, I'm Thomas. I'm one of the three owners of uh, InfoPark. And we are not in the catering business, <laughs> actually. Um, no, we are a, a software company. Um, we are also not a startup because the company already exists since 20 years. So we are already a while on the market. And what we do basically is <coughs> project and infrastructure for large websites. We run large websites, uh, whether it's airports, governments, insurance companies, banks, all the startups, or whatever. And we sometimes also do the design, but mostly it's all about the tricky, uh, tricky technical stuff. So when it gets really tricky, this is when we basically come in. And we also do have some standard software products, actually, um, which we offer. One of our latest products we actually have is a Scurito. You see that here. Scurito is basically a content management system, but usually content management systems like WordPress do suck, but ours does not suck because it's so easy to use. You can here go in and move stuff around, so it's very intuitive to can stuff edit directly on the website and whatever. So it's a, it's a great system. If you're looking for a great CMS, check out Scurito. Um, it's awesome. Um, and we are also hiring. Uh, we are hiring Ruby uh, people. We are hiring JavaScript and front-end people. So if you're interested in that, um, let us know. So I guess that's for the moment. Um, and so I'd like to hand over to Alex for the first talk. Thank you. Hello. I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm also wearing that for the live stream. So hello, Internet. I just need to set up one um, short moment. Um, <laughs> Technology, it just magically works, but it's the wrong way around. <laughs> so just one moment, please. Okay, so that's just on the wrong screen. Which one, which is it? There it is. Okay, so let's see. Yeah, there we go. Wonderful. It's working. So, uh, hello everyone. Thank you for coming out here to InfoPark at Marienfelde. Oh. So, uh, could. In the keynote itself, okay, so. As you can see, I'm not often presenting, so um, ah, there we go. If I can reach it with my mouse, I can, yeah, but I don't know where my mouse is. <laughs> there it is, and switch. 
Ha, there we go. Yeah, wonderful. Awesome. So the technical details have been um, taken care of. I'm Alex. I'm working for Infopark since, I don't know, ages. I started as a student and it's, I don't know, long time ago that I started here and I'm working as a software developer uh, doing in different projects uh, different stuff. Also mainly uh, writing Ruby code but also some JavaScript and also taking care of our Elasticsearch cluster. So today I want to talk about uh, running Elasticsearch in production. We have been using this uh, since ages, I mean five years, uh, at least five years now, and uh, this is going to be like an def, uh, uh, more like an ops talk, what we did and um, pitfalls we uh, experienced, and um, so, yeah. Thomas already showed you Scrivito, which is our content management system in the cloud, so you can use it uh, with Ruby, and in the future you can also use that with uh, JavaScript, and for that we have built-in search functionality, so you can uh, edit your content, and we have uh, so-called working copies, so you have uh, a full copy of all of your content, where you can just edit and do stuff with it, and for that we also have built-in search. So there's a lot of data which we uh, take care of, and for that we are using Elasticsearch, so currently we have around uh, 8 million documents in our our Elasticsearch cluster with around uh, 45 gigabyte of data and um, we had around 300 search requests per minute and 120 uh, index requests per minute so I don't know what your experience is uh, here in the audience probably I would I don't know if it's a mid-size or a big uh, cluster at least it gets some load so we need to uh, take care um, and um, watch that it's working correctly uh, we started out in 2011 with uh, um, Elasticsearch 0 0.17. I'm not sure uh, who were around at that time. <laughs> so that was back in the days. Um, and we had some experiencing experiences with that. Uh, in 2014, we redid all the setup and put in all the best practice that we learned over the time, uh, over the years, and also some training, and migrated to Elasticsearch uh, 1. And uh, last year we migrated to Elasticsearch 2, so we did not yet find the time to switch over to Elasticsearch 5, but since it's working really stable, uh, there's like no high pressure for us to move on to the newer stuff. So uh, currently we do have a, a setup there where we just use one giant index uh, with uh, 100 charts and two replicas. So in theory we could scale that up to 100 nodes, but uh, currently it's only running on three nodes. Um, and um, yeah, this is my overview. What I want to talk today, uh, tonight, um, I'm going to... Um, talk about the infrastructure, what we uh, use it for, uh, how we install the software on that infrastructure, how we do backups, how we do monitoring, uh, what our maintenance plan is, and also the pitfalls that we fall, fell into or learned over the years. Uh, you may notice that there are some cat pictures involved. Uh, I don't really know which pictures I should uh, took, so I just uh, did some cats. So if you're bored by my talk, you can just uh, at least look at the cat pictures. <laughs> So let's start with the uh, infrastructure. <laughs> Um, we are a cloud-based company and uh, have embraced um, Amazon Web Services since, I don't know, ages. Um, and all of our services are running on AWS since uh, years now. So for that, w that was um, our first thing we started, that we want it on AWS running. Um, we are currently uh, using the uh, EU uh, West 1 region in Ireland, since that's the first uh, European uh, region available. Now there is Frankfurt and other uh, areas are um, available, but we started with Ireland and still are still sticking with it. Um, for that, we are using the um, EC2, the Elastic Cloud Computing. I'm not too sure who's familiar with uh, AWS uh, in the crowd. Ah, okay, so at least most of it, So, um, but I, I s hope that I'm not dropping too many acronyms uh, and I hope that I always explain the full acronym beforehand. Um, we also manage those EC2 instances which are virtual servers run by Amazon um, using Opsworks and um, our cluster is currently not accessible through the public internet, so that gives us a lot of freedom with upgrading since it's not publicly accessible we don't need to up patch to the latest version once the latest version is available 
Um, this is a screenshot of Opsworks. If you're um, not familiar with it, it uh, gives us the ability to add instances uh, really easily to um, our cluster. We can also start and stop instances, and we can also manage uh, those instances, what software should be installed and which sh software should not be installed. We can also see how many instances are ru currently running, and so this is a screenshot of our current cluster, I think. So uh, three instances. Uh, running. Um, those are uh, for the AWS nerds under you. Uh, X3, Xlarge instances. Three, uh, th uh, three of them with uh, 2.5 gigahertz of uh, CPU. Uh, a lot of RAM. Uh, 30 gigabyte of RAM per instance, and also solid, uh, solid. Uh, Solid state disk, SSD, um, 80 gigabytes uh, per instance. So that gives us um, 240 gigabytes of data, which we can access. And w um, the operating system is Amazon Linux, which is a fork of uh, Red Hat, or at least based on Red Hat. Um, for the cluster discovery, we use this uh, plugin called um, Cloud AWS, which is actually provided by Elasticsearch uh, themselves. For them, uh, for that, we uh, use EC2 tags. You can, uh, for every instance that you start, you can add a, a tag to it um, and say, for example, the cluster name. And then um, Elasticsearch, once it's starting, uh, it will look for other instances who have that specific EC2 tag and uh, then try to form a cluster and if they do succeed then they start being a cluster and um, also for our cluster discoverability from our app site so we have an API server or several API servers who are accessing our Elasticsearch they um, are actually all running in, in a virtual private cloud a VPC which is a feature of um, Amazon where you can run kind of a local LAN just in the cloud and um, the Elasticsearch instances are private instances, so they can't be accessed from outside of the VPC, but only from inside the VPC. And our API servers are all located inside the VPC. And we do have an ELB, an Elastic Load Balancer, on fr uh, in front of the Elasticsearch, so that helps us from the API side, from the API server, really easily to discover the um, the cluster because we only have to point them to the ELB and it doesn't matter if there's like one instance or three or 10,000 instances or if uh, an instance re uh, reboots or not. Um, yeah, and the API uh, instances do have access to that ELB. So there, I do have a um, graphic for that. I'm, uh, let's see <laughs> if every can, if one can follow. So. Um, now, the outer skirts is the region of uh, AWS, so that's an island. In Ireland, we do have a VPC, like our private um, LAN thing there, and there we do have three availability zones, which is like this one. Well, well ba -ba -ba. <laughs> too fast. Uh, this one over here and the third one over here. So I'm just focusing on one of the three availability zones because otherwise it would be way too much uh, information. And inside that uh, um, availability zone, we do have a private uh, subnet where it can't access the internet uh, publicly and a public uh, subnet which can access the internet directly and also be accessed from the outside. So uh, this is the internet gateway which uh, talks to the, for, uh, to the outer internet. So if a request comes in, the, it will go through to the internet gateway and then we'll route to our API server where we can handle the request. We will then um, translate that into real elastic search uh, queries which will then go to a router and that router will go direct uh, to the elastic to the Elastic Load Balancer, ELB, and that will go to the Elastic Search instance, uh, Elastic Search cluster, which will then report uh, the uh, response to the API server, and then uh, the API server will respond to the outer internet. Um, if the Elastic Search instance wants to talk to the up, uh, outer internet, it can only do so using a NAT instance, a network address traversal instance. For that, this needs to be running, and um, we took really care that our instance, after its boot time, it's not necessary um, that it needs to talk to the inter outer internet for it to function. So uh, in theory or in practice, the net instance can go down or internet access from the net instance to the outer internet can be broken for whatever reasons and the cluster should still function and the API servers should still be able to access the, the Elasticsearch cluster. 
So for that, we took care um, to have um, it all running. We do have some instances where the communication to the outer internet is um, uh, important, for example, monitoring, because we are using external services which do um, receive those requests, and uh, currently we are using Scout for that, uh, which is bought by uh, Pingdom, I think like two weeks ago. Um, but um, so we do get notice if it's not available to the outer internet, but at least the cluster will continue to work. I hope uh, this is not too technical. <laughs> if there are questions, just um, raise your hand or ask. Um, yeah. All right, so we do have a VPC. There are some pitfalls uh, which you really need to uh, watch out if you're using that in production. One is, of course, you need that in NUT instance running. And also, if you use OpsWorks and a VPC um, with private instances, please disable auto-healing. We had several instances where um, OpsWorks were not able to see that the instance is still running and figured, oh, it must be broken, so let's restart it as soon as I can talk to it again. So after the internet uh, uh, recovered, then OpsWorks sent it to that instance, ah, please restart, restart, and then it will restart all your instances, which is not fun. Yeah, I saw a question. Ah, okay, I'm sorry, I did not in explain that. Yeah, um, it is a feature of uh, OpsWorks. Um, actually, um, I would say it's a nice feature if, uh, if it's working correctly, but in this case it's not. Uh, so the idea is that Opwork, OpsWorks pings your instances from the outside, from the outer internet, and sees uh, is this instance still available. And if it, doesn't, if it can't reach it anymore, then it will decide, ah, okay, this instance is for some reason broken, I will, I will just restart it for you. So it's... If it's working nicely, then it would be fun uh, or good, but with private instances, it's not working nicely because the instance itself can still be running and still be working function, uh, functionally, but OpsWorks can determine that it's like no longer running, so it will kill it for you, even though it's doing its job. So, yeah, it's a supervisor and, um, yeah. So if you have auto-healing enabled, then the um, NUT instance is your single point of failure. So if the NUT instance is going down, or if the NUT instance can't reach to the, the outer internet, then uh, your whole cluster will be restarted by OpsWorks as soon as it gets internet access again to that machine. Um, yeah, so how do we install stuff on those EC2 instances? So for that we use uh, cookbooks, um, also OpsWorks has cookbooks uh, baked into it. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, it's a, a scripting language where you can uh, say um, oh, how servers or, ser uh, or services should be installed, it's uh, comparable maybe to Ansible or Puppet. And uh, there's also a big supermarket, uh, chef supermarket, where you can buy cookbooks or at least download cookbooks which are open source, so there's quite a variety of cookbooks. Um, to install stuff like uh, Java version or Elasticsearch or um, other things. Uh, so we do uh, use a lot of those uh, standard cookbooks and we do also have some custom cookbooks. So one cookbook looks like this. I'm this is probably too small. Um, so it's a Ruby script uh, which uh, says, um, for example, that uh, please install Elasticsearch using tarball and you can find the tarball under this URL. So please download the URL and then unpack it and afterward install the service and so on. There are some dependencies on those cookbooks um, and some of those dependencies are not needed by us. For example, there's a Windows dependency and since we're not running on Windows, we don't need it. Or there's a 7-zip uh, dependency which is used if you are running on Windows and want to unzip your uh, zip, then you need this. But if you are on Amazon Linux or some other Linux variant, then it's not needed. So we do have then uh, a dummy cookbook which simply looks like this. It does has a metadata RB and says it's I'm I'm 7-zip and my version is 001 and this is all you need to override that cookbook. We used to uh, try out Berk shelf with it, but we had bad experience with it because it's, uh, I think it's really, um, really, really big. If it tries to be the bundler of cookbooks, but bundler is just one gem with zero dependencies. And if you install Berk shelf, I think it has like 
10 different dependencies and some of them are also C compiled and so it, it's, it just takes, uh, it feels like it takes forever to just install Burke shelf itself so we uh, switched over to a plain, um, plain cookbook variant where we just handle the cookbooks by ourselves. Um, for that, we do put all of our cookbooks, so all of those Ruby scripts, um, into one package. Uh, we also take a copy of Java, of Elasticsearch, and all the plugins that we need, and do put them all of them into one pri privately owned uh, single storage service S3 bucket. Um, so it's kind of an um, FTP server on steroids. Um, so this gives us the ability that um, uh, elastic dot co uh, elastic elastic uh, i o or what's the domain elastic co can go down or java can go down and we are still able to boot our instances as long as aws s three is available so that gives us the possibility to be um, fault tolerant and we also accept the license for the java runtime since that needs to be you need to click there. <laughs> um, yeah, this is our. Uh, those are our cookbooks that we're currently using. So we disabling swappiness. Uh, we are mounting our data volume. We are installing Java from the AWS S3 bucket, uh, which I mentioned earlier. We also install Elasticsearch. We are using Monet to start the Elasticsearch uh, server because uh, this is also a pitfall that we fell into. Opsworks sometimes, for uh, unknown reason, will restart your server but not execute uh, its cookbooks it should execute. So um, we sometimes had the instant, uh, incident that um, an instance just rebooted and uh, no cookbooks were executed. So the, the, the server was running fine, but no Elasticsearch service was started. So it did not um, operate as we wanted it. Uh, it will also install plugins, um, install our backup script, and also monitoring. Yeah, for us, um, da uh, disaster recovery is a really important topic. So we ha do have a lot of customers, and we don't want um, that we lose data of our customers, or that if our cl uh, cluster is, for whatever reason, not working anymore, that we can recover quite um, fast. For that, we do uh, use backups. Elasticsearch introduced uh, snapshots in version 1.0, which is a fantastic feature, I think. Uh, it really helped us uh, to do um, good backups of our clusters. So uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's doing a point-in-time copy of all of the Elasticsearch data. So you know at exactly this moment uh, that all the data that Elasticsearch is currently seeing is indexed. And even though it takes um, several minutes to do the copying, it still is just one point point in time copy. So everything that's happening in between will be ignored by Elasticsearch. So we, since Elasticsearch introduces in version one, we are also using it. Um, for that, we um, are simply running a, a cron job, which is a, a small Ruby script. And uh, the Ruby script itself will exit itself if it's um, not the master node. So it will just ask, hey, am I the master node or not? So this gives us kind of concurrency protection, <laughs> layman's concurrency protection. And since our master node is con not currently uh, constantly rotating, that's um, good enough uh, fit to, uh, to do that. Uh, for that, um, once uh, you are on the master node, um, it will do uh, create a new snapshot repository on AWS. So the, the location where the backup will be is on AWS, and it's, uh, it's a fresh uh, folder every day. And for that, we do have a data retention of 30 days. So we do use AWS S3 lifecycle rules so that um, S3 automatically deletes the stuff after 30 days. So we don't need to take care of cleaning up afterwards. And first of the month, we will keep it for a year, so 365 days. Um, also, we do an hourly incremental backup. So um, every hour, um, our backup is run. run. And currently, this is around uh, 50 gigabytes of data, which we put on um, S3. So we uh, experience around with uh, smaller intervals of backups, like every 15 minutes. But we noticed that especially um, 
during the end of the uh, the day the the restore time uh, increased dramatically if we use more increments because um the um elastic search will only back up the, the the things that happened until the last backup um or um so it uh, will just have a small diff but if it's uh, done every like 50 minutes or even uh, faster than that it will ha in worst case have to go through every 15 minutes back to uh, the first uh, snapshot of the day so that can take longer um, and for in our use case it's it's good enough to have a um, cop uh, um, uh, an hour old copy other questions okay so uh, a backup is only as good as uh, your restore procedure if you only writing a backup never check it and you don't really know if it's a valid backup or not. Uh, we do have a restore script, uh, which is also written in Ruby. And uh, what it does is clones the Opsworks uh, EC2 instances. So we do get a completely new cluster. Um, and it starts the instances and it then ask, it will ask you what backup do you want? Like, do you want the, the latest one or maybe like a, uh, a day or two ago? and then it will just do its thing. Um, currently, it needs around uh, seven minutes to boot the instances, which is uh, Opsworx specific, since uh, all the cookbooks are executed again. And uh, once the instances is running and the Elasticsearch cluster is running, the snapshot um, procedure, restore procedure of the snapshot takes about 22 minutes. So all in all, we do have an up and running um, Elasticsearch cluster with at least an hour old data in 30 minutes. So until now, we did not have to use it in, uh, in, in emergency cases, and I really hope that we never have to, but at least uh, this gives us the ability to have an, an, an at least somehow um, up-to-date in index. And um, we do have a, another database called DynamoDB where all our pr primary data source is, so we can then do um, re-index and catch up the last one or two hours or how many hours that is yeah so uh, besides um, backup we also need to know when the cluster is available or not um, so for that we do have monitoring um, currently we are using um, scout for that uh, or uh, now known as pingdom server monitoring so I don't know if you're familiar with them they're similar maybe like Datadog or other providers which do uh, monitoring so it's um, instance based so you we do have several metrics for each instance um, so we do check like uh, CPU how much um, is the instance doing um, how how much disk is used how many open files files are open. This is also a metric which we discovered during the our way that it's an important metric. Uh, how much memory are we using? Also, how much swap are we using? Um, the cluster status, is it green, is it yellow, is it red? Um, number of nodes. Um, uh, also, our backup. Uh, did the backup do its work? Uh, does it maybe take longer than usual? And also, um, do we have enough um, instances running in our uh, elastic load balancer. So um, this is a screenshot of our Scout dashboard uh, where you can s see several things. I think it's a bit too small probably to see, but uh, up here we do have like uh, how much uh, network um, is coming in and out. Uh, we do see how much write, uh, write requests are uh, on the data disk. Um, also, we do see uh, where we have it here. This is our custom metric that we introduced, the uh, Say Cheese uh, plugin, which uh, looks out that the snapshots worked. So there we can see the duration in seconds, how long did the duration take, and if it's, uh, I think it's now here, 40 seconds, um, we can see, ah, okay, it did not take that long. Or here we also had the, um, a uh, snapshot started minutes ago, so we see how uh, how long is the last snapshot away. So usually this should not be longer than 60 minutes because we're doing it every hour. And if it's taking longer, then we should log out for it. Uh, the good thing with uh, Scout and probably almost uh, or F any other uh, monitoring system is that we can also define triggers. So if some uh, number goes too high or too low, we can send out emails. Uh, we do have uh, several triggers. This is just uh, um, 
Um, some of them, uh, for example, um, is swap used, or is my uh, my disk running full, or um, is my um, my cluster number uh, a status number uh, down? So if, it, if is it no longer red, but uh, no longer green, but for example yellow, and we also uh, split up our triggers in two categories. For one is fatal. Uh, so this means like, okay, we need to act now because uh, our cluster is probably going to be down in, I don't know, minutes or uh, faster than that and also notice like, okay, there's something unusual going on, but um, maybe take a look, but it's not, you don't need to like drop everything to, to take care of that. Um, yeah, we do have another layer of monitoring, so to say. Um, so our API servers, they do have um, uh, error reporting, uh, which is where we use uh, Honey Badger. And if our request to the Elasticsearch server takes longer than two seconds, and that up to five times, then we will uh, raise an exception and say, oh, this is taking too much, too long. Um, so please uh, do something and <laughs> take care of it. Um, yeah. So, um, every good cluster needs also some maintenance. Um, we are in the position where we don't need to install uh, the latest update since it's not pu publicly accessible, but still maintenance is a good thing. Um, we are doing several things during our uh, maintenance phase. We are currently doing this around quarterly, like uh, three months. For that, we are checking if uh, newer operating system updates are available, our cookbooks are on the current uh, version, if there's a newer Java version or a newer uh, Elasticsearch version, and of course, uh, the plugins that we're using. And we're for that, we're also checking the change logs. Um, are there breaking changes or not? Uh, um, and also, we are doing um, our restore script. We check that every at least three months so that we make sure that it's still working because otherwise <laughs> um, it's better to do that regularly than in disaster recovery where you then just notice, oh no, our backup did not work at all, so we don't have a backup at all. Um, and once we check that and our cluster is running with a newer version, then we do a full re-index from the API server. So our API servers, they can talk to multiple Elasticsearch servers and uh, update um, both of them or several of them and only query one of them for, for the search request. So we can have the old cluster still running and answering the search requests and for the indexing requests, both clusters will um, receive updates. And once that is done, we can switch over. And if we are satisfied with the performance, then we can just uh, shut down the old cluster and um, move on. Yeah, so this is uh, now the pitfall section. I think um, some of them I already mentioned. Some of them I did not yet mention. Uh, minimum master nodes. I think uh, everyone who has done at least some kind of uh, of production work with Elasticsearch should be familiar with this uh, value. So it's really important that you always have um, the number or the total number of uh, nodes um, divided by two plus one as your minimum master nodes, because otherwise you will have a, a you you ra run in the possibility of having a split brain. Um, so the split brain, for those of you who are not familiar with it, means that every um, that two instances still live, but those instances can't talk to each other. So they think they are alone, and then they can receive updates. And if the minimum master node is not correctly um, configured, then they will say, "Ah, yeah, I can take your request, and I can uh, also uh, search it, but it will not uh, no longer be um, uh, up to date." Um, so, to, in order for that, to, to prevent that, you really should set the minimum master node to at least uh, number, uh, total number uh, divided 2 plus 1, and I think there's also good write-ups on Elasticsearch itself. Yeah? I'm sorry? Um, not yet. I'm, for us, currently, we do have only three, um, three instances running, and they do have... Um, not that much node that we do need extra, uh, like dedicated master nodes. Okay. Yeah. 
for us, it, uh, we uh, w did not have need for it yet, so we stick to the good old, just be anyone can, can be the master. Also, uh, this is also a recommendation of Elasticsearch itself. Uh, configure it to only use 50% of RAM of the process. We started out with way too much RAM. I think we uh, with like 90 or 95 and then no swap and uh, Elasticsearch then used more and uh, discovered that there's no swap left and then kind of exploded. Um, with a 50% of RAM you would think like, oh, isn't that a waste of uh, resources? But no, Elasticsearch can then uh, leave uh, the rest of the RAM over to the operating system. For that, uh, the operating system then can cache, read and write access to the data uh, to the hard drive. So it will speed up your Elasticsearch cluster. And the other three I already mentioned, VPC. If you're running VPC, the virtual private network, um, uh, on AWS with private instances, please disable auto-healing on OpsWorks. And also the start Elasticsearch via Monit and not just by cookbook. Yeah, that's it. Um, thank you for your attention and um, I'm <laughs> open for questions. Um, yeah, over there. Thank you. Uh, can you maybe to, uh, take the microphone so our internet listeners can also yeah. listen in? <laughs> Always someone on the, on, on the internet. <laughs> <coughs> um, you spoke a lot about uh, this uh, NAT uh, component of your Elasticsearch cluster. But you also s said something about having your plugins in S3. So I kind of don't understand why you actually need to go out of the internet if you have something like nearby that's like, la that is like this S3 component for installing the things. So I'm, 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 can, can you yeah, explain Yeah, I think I uh, did not make that, that clear. That? We do need internet uh, to boot up instances. So if we don't have internet or if the NAT instance is not running, we are not able to boot new instances. Like with? Like because of? Uh, because then uh, we can't download our packages from uh, S3, which is accessed over the internet. So um, most of the service from AWS are not uh, that interconnected that they can't uh, that they are independent of the internet, but they still rely on some kind of connectivity. Makes sense. Thank okay, you. there was another question over here. Maybe can you pass on the microphone? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, I actually have two questions. Um, one is, um, you seem to prefer the tarball uh, mm -hmm. over the RPM or packaged versions, which is maybe a relic because um, 1.0 didn't have RPMs in the beginning. Okay. Um, and I think as a consequence of that, you need to use Monad because it doesn't, the tarball doesn't come with an init script and doesn't come ah, with okay. system D units and everything that you would need to have an auto starting service. Okay, thanks so, for the um, if you if you're actually using the packages, it will install a proper um, service on the operating system. Okay, w so we will do that in our next maintenance. I don't know, to actually <laughs> if it works, um, I don't see no, any but particular reason I mean to change less, that. Less components which can fail, so uh, yeah. why not use the, the real The thing? other thing um, that I found striking is the huge number of shards you're using. <laughs> yeah, it's probably a bit over, uh, well, actually, oversized, I would I say. Well, actually, um, <laughs> uh, given the data size, um, you could be running with one shard. Yeah, that's true. Um, the thing is, uh, we are using so that we do have and it will only go to one shard. Uh, some queries, not all, but some queries can affect other customers. Um, so it's good that uh, for really large customers, the effect on the overall customers are then lower. Yeah, but the shard still lives on a machine and it still shares the same resources on the machine. And especially given that shard indexing buffers can take up to 40, 50, 300 megabytes of heap per shard. That seems like a lot of heap that you're potentially using for indexing buffers that you might not need. Okay. Um, so that that that's why it's striking. Um, mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that all the 
the statistics, term values, um, term stats, and stuff like that are all calculated on the shard level. And the less documents you have in a shard, I mean, okay, you have eight million documents, so you, you, you're not going to have empty shards. But, but um, the less documents you have, the more off your stats are. Um, the less accurate all of that gets, the less accurate, accurate the, sc the scoring gets. Um, the other thing is, if you're actually using 100 shards and try to distribute your customers, you could actually use 100 indexes with one shard, which would That's be awesome more or less the same. Okay. So yeah, so we'll, we'll take that into consideration for our next in the spot. So this you. is the one thing that is the most striking for me mm -hmm. on, on a cluster setup. I would never run 100 shards <laughs> on three nodes, like never ever. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We do have another question back uh, back there. I'm. Uh, I'm uh, curious about the use cases for the customers. So um, this looks like um, not the logging um, use case, but the APIs provide some some way of, of searching. So can you can you talk a little bit about <laughs> that? What what uh, we provide as a service for your customers and what yeah, features of Elasticsearch are you using for that? Uh, I I can actually I proposed two talks uh, for uh, this meetup. One was uh, the the ops part, and the other was our API that we offer on based on top of Elasticsearch. So uh, we picked this one. <laughs> so that's probably another uh, big talk. But um, um, let me see if I can uh, do that uh, really quick. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did not prepare that talk yet, so um, let's see, does that work? Uh, it looks like it, so um, no, that's not working. Um, so that's There we go. That works. Great. So, um, <laughs> um, live demos. <laughs> so, there we go. Um, we do offer the possibilities uh, that you can write uh, search requests uh, for the content that we uh, that you uh, have on or that a customer has uh, in our uh, content management system. So we do have um, uh, an API for that, uh, where you can easily, for example, uh, we do have so-called uh, OBJ classes, uh, so which is kind of a, a page class, so like, uh, for example, search for blog instances or search for about pages or search for uh, um, other kinds of pages. And uh, we do offer um, an API for that. Um, let me see if I can actually show you that in, 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 in real life. Um, that's probably more interesting than um, just reading the um, so I don't actually um, so let's see I uh, OBJ is um, an item inside of our um, content management system so every page is an OBJ and uh, we can say um, uh, we want like OBJ class uh, equals. Um, I think I do have a block. Block there. Let's see. Um, so it will do a request and uh, no, <laughs> no block. Um, let's say <laughs> publication. Okay, so I, you, you see that in this instance I do have uh, 1,700 uh, publications. And uh, I can actually start chaining this. Uh, so um, I want to say that uh, look for publications and also the title um, DE should um, search uh, for, um, I don't know, Berlin. Let's see if we do have something like that. So that will do a full text search on the uh, title DE um, field. Um, search is not valid. Um, so it's contains. 
It used to be search. Huh. So we do have two publications where the German title contains the word uh, Berlin. Um, and with that, we do have um, different operators. So this is uh, one of uh, the two operators, the search, uh, the, the equals one. Um, and the other uh, operator is the uh, contains one. And I think we have around six or eight operators uh, which you can combine. So you can combine uh, the, the field name with uh, values and you can also do things like uh, look over several uh, different field uh, field values if over different fields and also different values. Um, so this gives you the uh, possibility to uh, stack up um, search requests. <laughs> Sorry. Kind of a guess the answer, but it's a, it's actually a nice question. How this solution compare to what the DGM for the basic search, you know, like the, the integration level for Active Record? Uh, 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 when we built this, uh, the Elasticsearch integration did not yet exist, okay. um, so we, exist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we we built this out on our on our own, and it's also. Um, more specific to our use case and also we defined it as, a, as an own standing API so at least in theory uh, we could replace Elasticsearch with some other search technology we have done we, we used some other what was it Solarity something before or some older technology which uh, yeah but uh, we are really happy with Elasticsearch, when, so we don't have plans to like switch over to something else. But we do have a, a def well-defined API, so at least in theory, it could be possible that we switch Makes technologies. Sense. Thank you. Does this answer your question, or uh, you can come over later on, and I can show you some more uh, data of that? Okay, uh, more questions over here. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I guess the same answer, um, it's a relic applies here as well. Um, why don't you use Curator for backups? Greater? Curator? Which basically uh, does curator. what your, your, your Ruby script does. Um, I Wait, think we did not have a closer look into it yet. Um, because probably it probably did exist. not exist at the uh, time we right. wrote our update script, so okay. backup script. So right. that is probably Thank the main you. reason for it. Okay. Is this, this one actually the... <laughs> I don't know. Over there is another question. Uh, yeah, so mayb maybe not really question, but more feedback. So I sort of re-automated the deployment of our Elasticsearch classes several times in the last few years. So I started out with something similar to what you are doing, which is uh, a lot of uh, uh, deploy time, scripting of the environments. And my latest iteration actually did all of that uh, using Packer. So I built AMIs that have all the software that I want. And then my deploy process is really simple. Start that AMI, and I, I'll have three of those in the cluster. Um, do the right thing out of the box. They'll start packing themselves up, and uh, all of that. Okay, so, so, so Packer was the name of the yeah, product? Yeah, Packer, okay. And the cool thing with Packer is it takes existing provisioning, so you could just use your existing chef scripts, build AMI, and push it, uh, tag it, and then tell uh, in your deployment, uh, okay, boot, uh, that's AMI with that version uh, that I just uh, integration tested. Uh, okay. So oh, we'll, ha we'll have yeah. a look into it. Thank you. That's yeah. Can you use the microphone? So <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. It's like Bagra, uh, ba Bagran, but it actually creates uh, images. Yeah. It's a very useful tool. I also use it in several of my use cases, and it's very powerful to create these kind of solutions. OK. Other questions? So I do need to show one more slide, because I showed a lot of cat pictures, and I did not take all of them, but uh, used the wider internet for them. So here are the sources for that. So if you using want to use those cat pictures, uh, go ahead and have fun. <laughs> yeah. All right, thanks for your attention and um, yeah. So the next talk, is he here or? Uh, yeah. Ah, there he is, wonderful, great. So I can, um, yeah.
Schau, ich hab's noch nicht richtig. Test, test, test. Alright, this, this is working. Awesome. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, the great thing is I have about 10 slides and I also don't have a lot of stuff to demo, so it's not going to take ages today. Um, I'm Alex, I work for Elastic. Uh, we are currently in town for training, so because we keep talking all day, we're just not done in the evening, it's awesome. Um, I, I work on Elasticsearch. I'm usually working on one of the commercial features called alerting. Uh, but this one is about the Elasticsearch ingest node, the feature we added in Elasticsearch 5.0. And I just want to talk about how it works. And I also have a quick demo how to write your own ingest processes here. So, uh, what did we do and why did we do it? First thing is, um, Elasticsearch did not have any possibility to basically change a JSON document before index stuff. So there are still millions of reasons to use Logstash, but just for get up and running, there's no need for this. And I just want to make sure I get the point through, so um, we really need to be sure sometimes. All right, next slide. Um, before we get started, just a couple of definitions of um, what ingest node means and which APIs exist. And the first thing we have to be aware of is something we call a pipeline. And the pipeline is basically a guide to document enrichment. So when you index a document, you can also specify the pipeline that should be used. And the pipeline is basically a set of steps how the document should be changed. Um, so and these, these steps are called processes. A processor is kind of a single step to change a document. For example, you can add a field, you can remove a field, you can alter a field. Um, and each of those processes can be configured as part of the pipeline, like which field you want to add, which field you want to remove. All of this is stored in the cluster state, which basically means each node automatically gets to know all of the pipelines. So, APIs, th those are the, all the endpoints you need. Uh, you need to store pipelines, you need to check out pipelines and retrieve them, you need to delete pipelines, and there's one particular interesting endpoint that's a simulate endpoint. This endpoint basically allows you to see what would happen to a document if I index it with this pipeline. So you can see what would really be stored inside of Elasticsearch. So, processes. What can you do? Um, there are a couple of kind of simple processes like uh, uppercasing something, lowercasing something, removing a field, renaming a field if you need to move stuff around. Um, you can join fields together based on some criteria. There's a Grok processor. That's basically, you might know this from Logstash, where you can basically use regular expressions to dissect a field. Uh, so this is usually really useful. And there are a couple of plugins, like the user agent or the GUIP processor. So, uh, which also means that those processors are pluggable. And that's one of the more important features, because we are going to write our own plugin in a second. Um, the main reason here is that those plugins, like the user agent and the GUIP, they come with the, like, huge dependencies. There's a GUIP database bundled inside of that, which basically has a size of Elasticsearch alone. And that's the reason why we don't package it with core Elasticsearch. Um, same for the user agent uh, plugin. It's basically a plugin which allows you to um, add some more meta information based on the user agent information of a field. And this is also pretty big. 
The last one is the attachment plugin. Um, that one uses Apache Ticker inside, which allows you to um, send. Okay, how does this work? Um, you might have seen these kinds of pictures. Um, you have a client here, which basically sends a request over to Elasticsearch to any of the nodes, wants to store a document. Uh, we have a primary shard here, we have two replica shards here, and what happens in any Elasticsearch clusters, you send a document somewhere, the node which receives this request kind of figures out where's the primary shard, forwards the document over to the primary shard, the primary shard tries to index a document, if it's successful, it sends it to the replica shards, and only if all of this is kind of finished, we go back to this node, this node comes back to this node, this node goes back to the client and tells the client, oh look here, I index your document, everything's awesome. So, where do we enrich the document in this kind of steps? And uh, to kind of have a useful infographic here, I tried to search anything which resembles a pipeline, I couldn't find anything, and this cow looks really nice, so I just use the cow. And just to make sure we're good with analogies, uh, from now on we can just talk about beefing up a document instead of enrichment, and we are perfectly fine with analogy. So, in this example, we are specifying a pipeline ID in the put request. This basically tells Elasticsearch, before you index the document, please look up if this pipeline exists. If it exists, first enrich the document at the point where we basically entered the cluster, then send this enriched document over to the primary, then send this document over to the replica, and then go all the way back to the client, and client, look, everything's awesome. There's one potential drawback with this. Um, if we have, for example, the attachment plugin, which can easily eat a lot of CPU because we are parsing binary data, um, we don't want to interfere uh, the enrichment process with indexing or searching, so we have to make sure we keep this separate. So what we can do is we can have dedicated cows, aka ingest nodes, and what happens here is that there's a certain node role, and if we can't, or if we are not able to ingest because of the configuration, we just forward the whole request to another node which is dedicated for, for ingesting. And this is basically how you can have completely different scaling strategies for ingestion compared to indexing or searching. Yeah, does this make sense? Awesome. So, I kind of realized that I have completely forgotten where my demos are. But it's always good to be organized. So, we have samples. Do we have questions while you watch me type? Microphone? I just need more time, that's all the things. <laughs> we have to start Docker, so we have to spend some time here. Yeah, so uh, how does this compare to uh, the bulk API, and uh, especially with semantics? Um, so, I mean, the bulk API is basically the index API for many documents. And um, what you can do inside of the bulk API is that for each document you're indexing, you can specify a pipeline. So it's basically just on top of that. And what would happen with the bulk request is that it would also get forwarded to one of the dedicated ingest nodes, and from there on, it would be moved forward to the primary shard. Okay, makes sense. Answers your question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think it's a bit... <laughs> um, I think it may be a very good one, but can you um, see use cases where you will uh, where you especially will also use uh, this ingestion um, this ingest uh, node um, and not use uh, logstash or uh, use cases where you will like, where you will actually use logstash and not ingest node? Um, the latter one is pretty simple because for the uh, when you would want to dedicatedly use. Um, Logstash is when you want to write to more things than Elasticsearch. If you want to trigger PagerDuty alert, if you want to write to S3, then this is something which is easy to configure with Logstash if you do more than just Elasticsearch. Um, the, the other part is also pretty simple. Um, if you have a very simple configuration, like the one I'm hoping to show in a second, um, 
Like, for example, just have a local Apache log file that you want to visualize from last week's data, and you want to quickly index it. And it might be easier to just go with a small file build and send the data over to Elasticsearch instead of having logs in between. It's, I think at the end it's most about simplicity, and if you take a look at the um, Whoops. Damn, we have to see everything again. I'm sorry. No, we don't. Um, if you take a look here, uh, something like the integration with Apache Ticker doesn't exist for Logstash at the moment. So this is something we are basically stuck with this plugin. So after we finally started everything. You already got else, another question. We have another question. Awesome. A quick one, I hope. Um, <laughs> like, uh, what scripting languages can be used? Um, by default, it's the new one called Painless, but you can use any one what there's a plugin for. It's the Python like Python or something? No? Sorry? Python? Or yes. does that not exist? Python anymore? still exists, oh. but I think we have those kind of thoughts to no. remove it over time. Oh. <laughs> okay. What, what is, why do you not like painless? No, no, I don't, <laughs> I don't uh, have anything against it, but like I work a lot with yeah. linguistic stuff and like having Python as like, yeah, yeah uh, having I, full I Python access would get, get us like enormous like flexibility. Um, yeah, it's not like you, so you, you can't, you don't have this kind of full Python access in terms that you can access anything inside of Python because I oh. think we have the security manager activated, which oh might damn. limit some things. <laughs> no. okay. Maybe one, one quick question before you move forward. Um, how do you compare this API versus the stored procedures in traditional databases? Um, so stored procedures would be something that are kind of triggered at some sort of hook, like when you update a value, it's, it's very different. This is something which is a pre-index operation at the end of the day, and nothing more. Like there's nothing, you could run scripts during updates or anything like that, so I think the, the scope of this functionality is vastly different from store procedures. It's just a small, tiny feature that you can, could do, but uh, Again, it's usually pretty hard to compare SQL and non-SQL databases. I know, but I had to ask. <laughs> you had to ask. Is there a hidden agenda I didn't get? I had to put you in trouble. So. <laughs> All right. So uh, the first thing you should always do when demoing stuff is delete everything. It's great. After we did this, we can see that we have uh, a pipeline configuration here. Can you see this? Should I make it bigger? Awesome. So as you can see here, we are calling put. On, a, on the pipeline endpoint. This is the name of the pipeline called rename hostname. And then we have a, a list of processors. So this could be one step, this could be 100 steps. And the idea here is that we are going to rename the field hostname to the field host. And there's a special parameter which is telling the pipeline, like, if this field doesn't exist, just continue and do not abort. So if we have a document that doesn't have a hostname field, just keep going. So we can create this pipeline. If we get this response, we know every node has this one available. Uh, we could now put a document. See, it has been created. We could get this document, and we see that the hostname field exists. Why? We haven't specified the pipeline on indexing. So we haven't told Elasticsearch, please run this list of steps before you index a document. So if we want to do this, we have to specify the pipeline as part of the index request. So if we do this again, and then we are getting the document, we actually see that we have a host field. So we can take a look at the pipeline. It's not remarkable special. It's the exact same output as we gave as input. Uh, we can delete pipelines. And we run, run the simulate endpoint, and this is what is interesting, because this is how you would start constructing your own pipelines, configuring it, and customizing it. So in this example, um, we simulate the pipeline. We have the pipeline configuration. So what I want to do is I want to um, extract an Apache log file line. We have this uh, grok pattern. If you use logstash, this might be familiar. If you don't, this is basically just a set of regular expressions to extract every single field from a single line of a web server log. And you can see there's like some sort of 
descriptions for a regular expression and types. So in this example, we want to extract an HTTP date. In this example, we want to make sure that we are going to extract a number to find out if this is HTTP version 1.0 or 1.1. Uh, we can also specify a type here, which basically means after this field gets dissected, it also gets automatically converted to an integer before it's being stored. So we know that this is going to be stored as a number. QS is a quoted string, because if you take a look at those log files, you can usually see that there's the referrer and the uh, user agent put into in ticks, double ticks. Uh, and we have a couple of more processes here. We have a date processor, uh, which tries to convert a date from the input to a correct date and parses it. Uh, we have the GIP plugin. Uh, we have a user agent plugin, and we have a sample document. If I run this now, and we tend to wait because it's Docker, it's pretty amazing. Um, you can see uh, one thing that I didn't mention, but if you start up the Docker image, those plugins are automatically installed if you use the official Docker images provided by Elastic. Uh, if not, you would have gotten back an error telling you, please, this, this plugin, this processor is not known. Please install it. So what we can see here now is that with with this input field, so we only had a single document with a single field, which was just the message field, and the responding or resulting document is basically containing a ton of fields. We have this GIP field where you can see that the IP address I specified apparently seems to stem from Europe. Uh, you have a dedicated request field, the auth and ident information, the HTTP word being used, the original message, and so forth. So. We kind of dissected the document and spread it out across field. And now we could do all the fancy aggregations. We could like create an average aggregation to find out how big is your average request. You could sum up the number of bytes so you know how much you have to pay for your traffic, all the fancy things that you can do with aggregations. Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? Oh yeah, that's uh, that's basically just an internal. The, the three quotes here is just an internal representation of um, the console. The, if I would run this, uh, we are calling the command line. You would see a single tick. The idea behind this is like, for example, if you do scripting, you can do multi-line scripting with this, and you can type enter. I can show an example when we get to scripting in a second. For example, if you if you take a look at this pipeline simulation, you can see the script here, and this is. Well, not particularly readable. But if you do this, you can actually have kind of a multi-line script here. And this is why we have those three ticks, just to mark that this could potentially be in multi-line. So this is a script processor, which also supports Python. Um, if you install the plugin, it's not installed by default. Uh, this one is just using the standard scripting language, and what happens here basically is that uh, we just create a new field called bytes total, where we sum up bytes in and bytes out. And the nice part about this is we do this at index time, which basically means you can do calculations much more faster at query time, like the regular search trade-off. All the things you do at index time, you don't need to do at query time. So in this example, I have a sample document with a number of bytes in and bytes out. I'm running the pipeline. And there's a bytes total field, which has those fields summed up together. And of course, you, know, you can do like more fancy scripting stuff here than just adding things together. Um, there's a for each processor, which just allows you to walk through an array or to through an, uh, values of an array. Uh, what would happen here, for example, is that we would uh, basically rock, walk through the array field values and make sure that the ID field inside of this array is always converted to an integer. So if we have an example document like this one, where we have uh, our values array, and the ID is a string, we would be able to convert all of those into a number. So running this will result into the ID being converted to a number. Uh, we can also set some metadata, so we can not only change the document itself, uh, but we could also set some fields like the um, index name. So if we have time-based indices with the um, date inside of the index name, we could also change this. So if I run this, 
uh, I'm also setting the underscore ID field, so I'm really changing the ID of the document that is about to be indexed. And if I run this, we can definitely not cast things. Uh, the main reason here is that I'm absolutely using this for an older version of Elasticsearch where we removed this feature. So ignore this part. If in turn we run this, you can see that the ID of the document actually has changed. So if you want to overwrite certain documents or if you need to calculate the ID based on two field values, this is totally possible with this. The last feature I want to show before continuing is um, a simulation for some sort of dead letter queue because we haven't talked about handling failures. What happens if one part of all of those processors is failing? Like, do you want to uh, stop the indexing operation? Uh, do you want to do anything else? Um, do you want to just lose the information that you were not able to index the document and that's it, which would not be very smart? So in this example, there's another onFailure field inside of that. And the onFailure field basically means if there's any failure while walking through each of my processes, uh, just set the index metadata field to failed index. So after this and running the um, running the simulate endpoint, this document would have end up in failed products. So you can just, um, for example, if you like importing 5 million products and you have 50 of those ending up in this failed product index, you can just uh, tweak your pipeline and re-index those from this index. Uh, that's almost it with the with a introductory demo. Uh, one last thing is that you do have statistics about ingestion. So. Um, as I said, ingestion can eat up a lot of CPU. It can take some time if you have to uh, parse the metadata of binary, binary formats. Um, so what you can see in the statistics is basically uh, the total amount of time you're spending with just ingesting before it sends stuff over to the um, index operation. You can also see how much current requests are being processed and how much requests in total. Might be a good indication when you forget to add the pipeline parameter to your, to your bulk request. Questions? Awesome, no questions. I can just keep talking, it's great. So, if we go back to our presentation and we start where we stopped. Uh, yeah, we have, this is our next topic, so I can right switch back to the, um, to the browser. And what I basically did is I wrote a small template that you can create your own ingest processor in a couple of steps. It uses cookie cutter, which is the Python templating tool. So all you need to do is to increase the font size. Um, you can just call it like this, and you're going to get asked a couple of questions of how your new plugin should be named like. So I came up with really good default values here. Um, so I'm going to call this awesome. Uh, that's just a package deal. You can add a description, which you can see in the node statistics if you call it. Uh, you should always add your developer name and the Elasticsearch version. And I already tried that before this. So let's try this again. So if we come up with this and we filled out the information, you will have an ingest awesome directory which resembles a plugin structure. And if we take a look, you can see that all those files are being created automatically. And Taking a look in the source directory, you can see that there's a couple of Java classes already pre-created. There's a processor, which you could fill with, uh, fill with live. There's a plugin Java file. So everything you need to actually create a plugin is already pre-created. And the nice part about this is we even added tests. And you can run Gradle out of the box. And what the Gradle stuff is doing is um, it's basically compiling the project, but because it uses a um, the Elasticsearch dependencies for testing, it's starting up an external Elasticsearch instance, is installing the plugin, is running REST tests against this plugin, and you don't have to do anything for that except using Gradle because it's, it's reusing our, our Gradle infrastructure. So it's, it's also like reusing our check style configuration rules. Um, so a couple of things. It's also making sure that you don't bundle too many dependencies inside of your plugin. So there's a ton of checks which you don't have to care about. And this one is basically first running unit tests, which have been successful. And this one is basically starting up an external Elasticsearch process, installing the plugin before that, and then running the REST tests. Um, we can open this in an idea.
So we have an awesome processor, which is basically the, the base class to implement your own processors. Um, in this example, you need to basically uh, configure a method called execute, and this execute method would be executing all the logic in, inside of your processor. So if you wanted to add two fields, you would have to configure which fields to add and would do the, the coding inside of that. Uh, if you take a look at the plugin class, so this is basically how you write an Elasticsearch plugin. Uh, you create a class that extends plugin and implements ingest plugin. You configure the processors that should be part of the plugin, and this is pretty much it. And everything here is pre-wired. Also, there are pre-written tests. So there's a unit test class, which basically means um, that everything that you do for basic testing of your processor doesn't require an Elasticsearch instance. All of this can be run as a, as a pretty fast unit test as far as, as it gets on a couple of years old MacBook. Um, so it's, it's really easy to, to get up and running with an ingest processor and you have to make sure you enable assertions, which is basically just an additional testing check. Um, and this is, this is the kind of, of basic setup. And from here on, you could write your test assertions. Um, so what, what could we do? So we have an in input document here, which has a source field called fancy source field document. And maybe what we're expecting is um, that our processor just should just lowercase everything. So no matter what we're putting in here, fancy source field content. We could run the tests. See that it fails kind of expectantly because we haven't changed any implementation. And from that point in view, we could just do um, call the implementation itself here, call the processor tests, and they would pretty much pass. Uh, on top of that, we basically have those REST tests. So REST tests are um, tests written in, in YAML, provided as part of Elasticsearch, and all of our official clients that we have in PHP, Python, Perl, JavaScript, they are basically have to pass those kind of REST tests inside of Elasticsearch to make sure that all of our clients are on par, and you can just use them as part of our integration testing as well. So running here, we have just a, a kind of ingest pipeline setup. You can see that I'm going to create an awesome processor with a source field where to read the data from and a target, target field. And in this example, we would be expecting that the target field would be EULAVYM. And what we could do as a next step is again, just run Cradle check to see if Elasticsearch is started up properly. And we can install the plugin and we can run the REST test against this Elasticsearch cluster and then see that everything is working. And that's the, the whole idea behind writing your own Ninjas processor. So let's see if I was able to type my value correctly backwards. Apparently not. So what we see here is that it was my value. And I assume I just didn't clean my workspace. Is it possible that the Gradle daemon is caching things? Uh, yeah, I did implement lowercase. I wanted to implement reverse, but that's a problem when you're not, when you've been talking half of the day. The, de the test is, you can see how awesome the test framework is. So apparently what we really want to do is this. Run Gradle check again. At least someone didn't fall asleep. I appreciate that. So, also like one thing I didn't mention um, that you have to configure some sort of, if we take a look at the, nah, that's nasty today. So, expected my value, but was my value. If 
field one, my bad. Yeah, it's that one needs to be fixed. That one needs to be the same. So what we do here, I really didn't bother to read too much. So we have an index operation here specifying a pipeline. And this is basically kind of the assertion what I'm doing in the test, right? I'm getting back the document and making sure that it was set correctly, but I didn't set it correctly when I was indexing it. And this was the reason why it wasn't working. Damn. Why that? Let's see what I did in the implementation, just to be sure. That's why you don't program in the evening. So, that implementation looks good. Uh, what you also can do is you can kind of configure how the configuration of this should look like. Right now we only configure the source field and the target field, but maybe you need to configure more options or add more fields. That would be happening in this, in this factory here. And this build was actually successful. And you can also, after the build, go to the distributions directory. And you see that your zip file is lying around. The zip file is just a plugin that you would be using to install Elasticsearch. And the, the infrastructure of this tooling around Gradle has also created a security policy file for the Java security manager. I haven't talked about that one. I'll get to that in a second and a so-called plugin descriptor properties file that's kind of a metadata file that needs to be created for every plugin that you want to install in Elasticsearch. So if we go back to this, um, I basically have three more things about writing your own processor to tell, is that you can write them as own plugins, you can use any JVM language you want, um, but the last part is the important one. It's awesome that they're fully unit testable, while Elasticsearch has this tiny little feature called the Security Manager, which prevents you from uh, loading arbitrary files in your, in, your, in your plugin. It prevents you from opening directories. It should prevent you from opening sockets. So we just try to protect you that if someone is able to hack Elasticsearch plus the Java Security Manager, that he can spawn processes, bind shells, do nasty things, delete all your directories that you have, um, but this also means that you have to cope with this when you're writing your own plugins because you can't do anything you want. You have to, exam for example, if you want to read a configuration file, it only works inside of the config directory and nowhere else. It's just something to keep in mind while you're dev developing. But the good thing is the security manager is always enabled when you're running all your tests, so you pretty f quickly know when stuff is failing. Okay. Um, that's pretty much the kind of quick demo. Uh, if you're interested in more, this first thing here is this presentation, but I think it makes more sense to show a couple of links. Um, so I kind of wrote up all of this in a blog post, so you don't have to listen to me, it's, it's great. Um, the blog post has another small example uh, where we are going to, where is it? Where we're going to extract URLs from fields. So there's a small dependency. Uh, which will extract any URLs or email addresses from text, and you can put them into your own field. So you can use that one for searching or just for, for displaying instead of parsing a lot of text on, on runtime. Uh, and it would, would work like this. If we take a look at this test again, uh, you have a field that contains a URL, and then there's a second field, which is an array, and that contains all the URLs which, which occurred. In More examples. Um, I've rolled a tiny little plugin called Ingest Lang Detect, as an example, that uses a small uh, dependency which allows, or which, uh, which uses language detection and tries to find out which language a certain uh, field is written in. Uh, so it's using as a dependency is uh, something called Detect. I think it was written by Google. So there are a couple of presentations out there for people now. And the other thing I just, I, I can do this quickly, an integration with Apache OpenNLP. Um, OpenNLP is uh, an Apache project for doing a couple of things around NLP. And this one is just doing named entity extraction. So you can extract dates, locations, or whatever you have kind of predefined models for. Uh, the way it would work is basically you configure the models, 
Um, if you have some sort of data field like this one, you can see there are a couple of names there. There's a couple of locations, and those are basically extracted into their own fields. So those are two plugins which you should just use as some sort of reference, maybe inventing your own. And this is the, the cookie cutter repository. Uh, you can clone it or just call cookie cutter and whatever you want, and you end up with a, with a plugin which should give you a starting point how to continue from there instead of taking a look at other plugins and ripping all of the code apart. All right. I think I'm pretty much done, and we totally have time for questions. Please grab the mic or a beer. Yeah, so thanks. Uh, really nice to see the development tooling. Uh, so that's one, one thing that I've missed in the past few years is sort of the, the, the development infrastructure for testing, right? So we know. Is, is this something that Elasticsearch is going to support officially at some point, or is this just a side project for you? Um, the, the infrastructure is completely supported. Okay. Um, so if you take a look at my typing skills, um, you can see that all you have to add is the kind of build tools dependency. And this right. one is built with every official Elasticsearch release. I didn't add anything here. Yeah. I just make use of other people's work. That's great. Nice. This is really the first time I, I, I'm aware of the existence of this thing. Yeah, we are not too open because we yeah. still haven't figured out if it's going to break backwards compatibility with the release or another. Yeah. So that was my next question. So I think with version 6, Sort of embedded nodes are sort of a bit out of the question, right? Or uh, that's one of the reasons why we start this external node. Yeah. Because this also, I mean, embedded nodes is kind of a nice feature, but it doesn't resemble the real life scenario on setup, and that's yeah. the main reason why we created all this Gradle infrastructure because it serves us very well, and as you can see, it can also serve your own plugins very yeah. well. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Awesome. No questions. I think we're done here.